Scott Brick, welcome back to the Baseball Bookshelf Conversation. Ron, it's so good to be back here. It's been a dozen years. Uh, it's so hard to believe it's been that long, but uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, we're delighted to have you. We're both uh, sporting our uh, pandemic quaffs, as you uh, referred to it before. COVID quarantine quaff. <laughs> so the uh, people who follow my blog know that every Friday I put up a baseball bestseller list, and it includes print version, ebooks, and audio. And for uh, the past several months, Moneyball is one of these books that is every single week is in the top 10 list. Uh, but I noticed in the audio book version, there were two, two, and they were different. And I am known for plenty of typos. So it isn't beyond the realm of possibility that I just made a mistake and put it in twice. But finally, I looked into what the difference was between the two. One is read by Michael Lewis, the author, but it's an abridged version. Mm -hmm. And I was delighted to see that you did the unabridged version. So tell us for, well, we'll start at the beginning. Tell us how you got into this business of audiobook nar narration. Is that the proper term? Indeed, yes. So how did you get into the business? Um, it's... Uh, uh delightful to answer that question because uh in answering that question it's like you know it's essentially at the same time um i got into the business of audiobook narration when i was narr narrating moneyball um it was one of the first jobs i did um uh i was a theater student at UCLA um, um, in the theater and television department. And um, I, uh, uh, a buddy of mine that I played baseball with every Saturday, which is the wonderful irony of this, was that uh, we would play baseball every Saturday afternoon. My buddy, Bob Westall, was working for a company, um, uh, Dove Audio, I believe was was the name of the entity. Uh, sadly, they went BK, they went bankrupt uh, shortly thereafter, but uh, they had made a big name for themselves um, after the O.J. Simpson trial. Uh, Faye Resnick, I believe, was the name of the woman who was... Um, really good friends with Nicole Brown Simpson. Um, and uh, that was that was the company who had done the audiobook for um, uh, essentially a, like a, a tell-all book. And um, when it came out, uh, my buddy Bob was working for them and said, hey, my friend Scott is, uh, I've been following him on stage for a great many years maybe you might want to hire him to do audiobooks and i think it was eight months before they went bankrupt um um they uh they hired me to do my very first audiobook and it as i've always said uh in the audiobook industry um it's it's audiobooks are very um the industry is very incestuous in a good way uh when you work for one company another company will come in and say hey you should work for me so uh, uh that's essentially what happened um and i wound up working for a company that had hired me um to tangentially to do that uh, one of my first jobs uh, at uh, Dove Audio. Uh, he had left Dove Audio and hired, gone to uh, uh, create another um, another studio for uh, books on tape. Um, hired me to come in and record. One of the very first jobs that he offered me was Moneyball. It is, it's funny that Moneyball is, I don't think people realize how long it's been since Moneyball was published. It's like 20 years almost. 20 years. 20 yeah. years. And it's still yeah. 
on, like I say, it's on the baseball bestseller list every week. Uh, people still constantly refer to it for better, for worse, uh, mm. as the new level of statistics have somewhat taken over the game. Uh, you've done other baseball books as well, haven't you? What What are some of those titles? Um, I did a, um, and, and please forgive me because it's been over 20 years now and um, I've done over over a thousand books since then mm -hmm. a literal thousand books since then i've done um um bios of ted williams of babe ruth um i i did a book about uh just comedic stories about about baseball i honestly don't remember the titles um it's uh it's really been wonderful because i you know, I've been a uh, an LA Dodgers fan. I I grew. I look. I live here in LA. I, I've I've grown up here uh, uh, as a fan, and and I it's it's been wonderful getting to talk about my sports passions in life, um, um, especially professionally. Um, I did a book called The Big Bam, which mm -hmm. I believe was um, the title of a Babe Ruth biography. By I Lee don't Monville. remember. Oh, I'm sorry. Lee Monville was the author. He also did a very Lee good book. Lee yes, Ted right, exactly. That's right, The uh, uh, and the Ted Williams bio, which I don't remember. Um, and, uh, and, and I remember the Ted Williams biography. I remember the afterword that he shared and said, you know, um, Ted wasn't a wonderful guy, <laughs> but he was a brilliant ball player. And he used the, um, um, the example of, uh, he said when he was a small child, he had sent a letter to, to Ted and said, you know, I would love an autograph and was sent back one in return. And the more he did research on this biography of him, he realized Ted never signed that mm. autograph. And yet, and yet he said, I choose to believe that he signed mine because I need to have that connection to him you know it's it's like when you you know if you're a star trek fan you send off a letter to william shatner and um you get a, a signed autograph in return and then you look online and realize the guy's kind of really not the guy's kind of a dick uh, essentially <laughs> you know he's he's William Shatner is not a nice guy. He's he's not he's not all that nice. Um, um, I, and I know this because he lives about a mile away from my house, and I've met him a number of times. And um, you know, you have to realize at some point that you need to separate the actor from his work, and it's the same way with ball players. Um, and that's kind. of essentially the lesson that I learned uh, through Lee Montville um, when I was doing that biography of Ted Williams. It's like, okay, well, he did this in baseball history. He is this when you meet him in person or when you met him in person, clearly. Um, and how do you, you know, how do you uh, consign that in your in your memory? When, when you're an actor, I know a lot of actors really do a lot of research in preparing for their roles. Do you do any kind of research in preparing for the book or do you just have the book and you go with that? Uh, it's a marvelous question. Um, in ordinary circumstances, if you were, let's say I was going to, play ted williams on camera 
um, you would do a great deal of research, um, as I have done, you know, just for, you know, pleasure because I'm a huge baseball fan. Um, from an audiobook standpoint, um, I have to be honest, I set the research aside. I want to know everything in terms of, you know, how to pronounce baseball players' names. And in, in that circumstance, um, the Hall of Fame, the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown has been an absolutely marvelous uh, resource, uh, you know, how, I, I want to make sure that I pronounce everyone's names. And in e uh, uh, myself, uh, producers, directors that I've worked with have called Cooperstown and said, how do you pronounce this guy's name? Uh, uh, you know, Orlando Cepeda. You know, I, when you look at it in print, it's like Cepeda, 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 you know, there are so many ways that you might be able, if you had no idea of, of how this name might be pronounced, uh, the Hall of Fame has been a marvelous opportunity, uh, a, a marvelous uh, uh, resource. And yet, um, beyond that, there is, I try to set aside everything that I've learned. Um, because Every author out there, whether they're writing fiction or nonfiction, everybody has an agenda. Like it or not, we all do. Um, everybody has a, a, a story that they want to tell. And um, um, other than the facts, you know, how to pronounce their names, um, I, I really want to set it all aside and err on the side of whatever the author's agenda is. And, and again, not to use that as a, a pejorative, a derogatory term. It's just, you know, hey, I want to talk about Ted Williams as a marvelous human being. I want to talk about Ted Williams as a marvelous ball player. Well, those are two different things. And, uh, you know, those two authors would have two different agendas. So it's like, okay, well, I want to err on the side of caution and give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, they, they have spent a year of their time writing this book. I haven't. I'm spending a week of my time narrating this book. So I want to, again, err on the side of caution. So that brings up two points I'm glad you brought up. Uh, I have always felt whenever possible i prefer listening to the author read the book because the author knows exactly hears it in his or her head what the word should sound like what the emphasis should be of course but that's not always possible you know some authors don't have the voice for it they don't have the patience for it they don't want to do it they're nervous about it but uh have you ever had an opportunity where you have sat down with the author to discuss how you're going to do this? Like working with a director in a movie, let's say, or a theater production? Well, many times, um, not typically on sports books. Um, and I, I, I want to um, emphasize that uh, <laughs> uh, whenever I get to work on a sports <laughs> book, it's, it's the highlight of my year because I, seriously, my girlfriend can tell you, that uh, uh, I have ESPN-itis. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm a sports addict. <laughs> um, uh, but many a time I have been able to have conversations with, uh, uh, conversations with authors who um, will tell me, okay, well, this is what I was thinking when I was writing this book. Um, this is kind of what I'm looking for in the, uh, um, in the protagonist on this novel. Um, it doesn't happen very often in biographies, uh, nonfiction titles. Um, 
it happened almost 20 years ago. I did a book. Um, gosh. I wish I could. Man, I wish I could remember the title. It was a, a biography. And again, I'm sorry. It's a thousand books have come. Literally a thousand of books have come and gone since then. I was narrating a book about Joe Namath. And uh, um, the author was hoping to get across this um, curious phenomenon uh, where Joe's accent changed. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, he grew up uh, in Pittsburgh. He, then he went to college. Uh, in the South, and then he wound up playing in New York. And, and, and uh, again, please forgive me if I'm if I'm getting my facts wrong. It's almost 20 years ago now that this happened. But essentially what he was saying was, I would prefer it if you would use the accent um, from New York. Hmm. And uh, I said, well, I hate to tell you this, but... Uh, I'm from LA and I think I have a rather cosmopolitan accent. Um, but, um, I'm, when you do nonfiction, you don't try, you know, look, even if a, even if a guy was born in the South and wound up playing in New York, uh, uh, even if a guy was born in New York, wind up, uh, playing professional football or baseball in the South, it's like, well, However, he changed his accent, um, again, according to this author. Um, I'm like, that's not me. I, I, I'm just going to read it as me. And, and I sent him that email, and I never heard back. And uh, I assumed that meant he was okay with it. But I was like, look, uh, whatever you want, whatever you, whatever you want me to say, I will say. But... Um, the fact of the matter is whether the person is born in the north or the south or the east or the west, um, it's going to sound like me. <laughs> Certainly when it comes to nonfiction, you know. Now you mentioned uh, the amount of books you've done. How long does it take to do what I know it's going to be hard for you to pick a specific book and say it took me X amount of time to do Moneyball. But I don't think people appreciate I think they think you just sit there with the book and read it straight through. That's not the case. How, how does, what's the process of, of doing a nonfiction book like this? Well, um, somebody will get in touch and say, do you have X amount of dates open? And that's typically about three months before the book comes out. Uh, before the print version comes out, either in ebook form or um, hardback, paperback, what have you. Um, I'll check my schedule, and if I have time for it, I will you know, mark it in. I will let them know. And um, uh, the director slash producer of the book, um, uh, who I'm going to work on on it with, we uh we check in about a month uh mm, a couple of weeks before it happens um when it comes down to actually recording it uh once we settle on a date well uh, look i just i i'm working on a book right now um it's going to come out in about 10 weeks and um um once we settle on a date uh we the typical book is about 11 hours long the i i want to say if you go onto audible.com uh you can check for the length of an audiobook um, anything from like 30 minutes to 30 hours uh the average book is about 10 to 11 hours long and um once we settle on dates which is about you know again three months maybe two and a half months before it comes out um we we start recording and it's about uh 
Um, I can usually get about three hours done per day, three finished hours done per day. So when you look at your audiobook, if it's um, if it's three hours long, odds are I got it done in a day or very close to it. If your book is 30 hours long, I got it done in 10 working days, um, maybe two weeks, you know, two working weeks um, with weekends included. Um, that's essentially, uh, for myself, I aim for about three finished hours per day per book. So fiction and nonfiction, that's essentially, that's the, um, you know, that's the schedule I'm aiming for. Do you go into a studio for this? I know today we're talking from your home studio, but do you go to an outside studio or do you record it at home? Sure. Um, I have to be honest, I much prefer working uh, at someone else's studio. I have, uh, yes, I have my own home studio. Um, it's nice and and I I know so many people who say, I would love to work from home. And I say, I always tell them, be careful what you wish for. Uh, um, I My commute for the last year and a half because of COVID, um, my commute has been about 90 seconds. <laughs> um, I walk down to what used to be the basement of my home. Um, I... Uh, uh, I don't know. I I'm I think I'm I'm a little bit different. Uh, I I teach a great deal for um, I teach a great deal to uh, other voiceover artists, um, people who do promos and uh, uh, you know their radio DJs or you know what have you, and they want to get into audiobooks. And uh, they say, hey, I hear, you know, audiobooks is a, a great way to make a living. And uh, <laughs> again, you know, it's, be careful what you wish for. Um, they say, you know, I have my own home studio. And I actually resisted putting in a home studio for many, many years because I'm just, I'm a book fan. I love books. Um audio or otherwise print audio what have you um and uh when i have an opportunity to go to someone else's studio and you know um um record somebody's work uh fiction or non-fiction i i just adore it and what i what i adore most about it is lunchtime when we all gather in the lunchroom and talk about hey you know what are you working on right now oh i'm working on a, a book in this fantasy series oh i'm working on a romance novel oh i'm working on a um um a, a fictional account of a non-fiction story kind of like a um um in cold blood or something like that um because again i'm a fan i'm a fan of of books in general and when i'm when i'm working on a when i'm working on a really great book i want to tell people about it and so walking into that lunchroom is a wonderful experience where I can say, oh my God, you have no idea. I'm working on this Ted Williams biography. I'm working on the Big Bam, Lee Montville's you know, marvelous biography of, of uh, Babe Ruth. Um, but when I'm working on a bad book, it's, it's kind of the opposite. It's like, oh my God, this is the worst book in the world. <laughs> this, I, I just want to bitch and moan about it. It's like, you know, if it's a good book, I want to praise it. If it's a bad book, I want to bitch and moan about it. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where I am. I haven't been able to do that for a year and a half, so I'm kind of looking forward to being able to do that again. Do you have a preference, fiction or nonfiction? Um, man. Great question. Um, 
because as an actor, I imagine you would enjoy fiction because you get to play many different roles, actually, uh, assuming that you were the sole narrator, sole reader for a book. Well, yes. Um, and again, here I am trying to separate myself as Scott Brick, the book fan versus Scott Brick, the um, audiobook narrator. Um, like everybody else, I have my favorites and um, I love working on nonfiction. I've always loved reading nonfiction when it crosses my path from uh, my fan perspective. I love baseball. Uh, I've grown up in Hollywood and worked in Hollywood. I love reading, you know, true crime or uh, biographies written about Hollywood. I just finished a book about George Reeves, the um, um, the actor who played Superman, and his, you know, air quotes, suicide, which was clearly murder, um, which was never brought to justice. Um, I I love books like that um, as a as an audiobook narrator i essentially you know there are projects that cross my path at, uh, the convergence of my particular you know my preference for reading uh, as a fan and as a narrator uh, when they converge um, I love books. I love titles when they come along like that. And yet what I'm fascinated by are the titles that are outside that realm. It's like, okay, yes. Um, send me a book about George Reeves um, and his, again, air quotes, suicide. Um, I would be all over that. But if you sent me a title about George Reeves, uh, that just talked about his life before Superman um, when he was in Gone with the Wind. I would, I would nod my head and say, oh my God, yes, please. I would love to record this. Um, <laughs> this story I always tell is that uh, <laughs> about 20 years ago, I was uh, asked to narrate a title about um, Raymond Burr, the guy who played Perry Mason 30, 40 years ago. Um, and and it was a, a fascinating idea for me when they said, hey, are you interested you know, in a bio of Raymond Burr? And I was like, yes, the guy was, he, look, he was a, he was a closeted homosexual um, as so many actors were back then, Rock Hudson and others. Uh, they tried to make a marriage work um, according to, you know, quote unquote, you know, what society deemed appropriate for, for them. Um, he married a woman, had a, had a family, and they were killed tragic. They died tragically. And I, I thought, you know, this would be a wonderful story to narrate. Absolutely, I'm in. And then I arrived at the studio and they said, they handed me the uh, the manuscript and it was, turned out to be a biography of Aaron Burr, the guy who <laughs> killed Alexander Hamilton. Whoops. And I thought, oh no, this is not the same thing. Um, wow. Yeah, uh, that, was a, that was a bad day. I had actually <laughs> done, I had actually done the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, biography of um, um, Alexander Hamilton, the the one that the mu the musical was based upon, and um, I was like, well, I don't know that I really want to do an Aaron Burr biography, but I had already agreed to do it, so off we go. <laughs> um, um, so occasionally, I'm offered projects that are kind of in my wheelhouse like that um you know 
the Alexander Hamilton bio was in my wheelhouse. The Aaron Burr biography was not. Um, but essentially what it comes down to is did this, this author essentially spent a year or more of his life, his or her life, um, working on this book. And I want to set aside my own thoughts about the subject matter, um, fiction or nonfiction, and say, well, you know, this is their passion. Uh, this person thinks uh, a bio of uh, um, Aaron Burr would be a wonderful thing for people to read and or listen to. Okay. I try to set aside my own personal thoughts about that and just carry on. You ever get feedback from authors after you've uh, done the book? Yeah, um, I do, um, which is really nice. Um, um, Nelson DeMille was the very first author who got in touch with me. Um, he writes contemporary uh, American 21st century thrillers, um, typically uh, spy, um, um, well, not, I'm trying to think of the best way to uh, describe it, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, espionage thrillers. Um, when he started getting feedback from people about the audiobook, specifically to the print version, he would forward them to me and say, hey, you deserve this as much as I do. Oh, nice. And, and I thought that is one of the most generous, well, gestures, really, um, that I've ever dealt with from an author before. Um, he's done it easily. His staff has of course, done it since then for 20 years and a, a thousand times since then. Uh, whenever they get uh, an email, snail mail, whatever it is, if it's snail mail, they will um, um, scan the article of mail and send it my way, email it my way, or if they get it via email through their website, uh, um, far more often, obviously. Um, and I just, every time it happens, I think this is extraordinarily generous. Um, look, they write it. I read it. The fact that they're sharing the credit for me um, is lovely. There, I, I can't remember the name of it. There was a movie a few years back about voice work uh, where there, there was the daughter of a very famous uh uh in a world that's it that's it. in, in a, world. a world yes a in number a of friends of mine were in that movie yes so do you watch stuff like that will you watch something like that and, and are you do you say this is accurate this is inaccurate like my wife's a veterinarian so whenever like all creatures great and small uh comes on like there's a new version now on pbs we'll watch it and she'll say well it might not work like this it might but then again this was like i don't know 80 years ago in, in Great Britain. So you can't compare the two. But for something like for something like that, do you think that was an accurate depiction of the profession? I, yes, I do. I think, it, I, I think it's, I absolutely think it's accurate because what it is is essentially rewriting the genre uh, for uh, a newcomer to you know, enter into the genre on the ground floor. Um, it, from my own perspective, um, from my own perspective, uh, uh, In a World was written about Don LaFontaine, mm -hmm. who is the most famous voiceover guy in the world. 
um, who, who ever lived. And he was the guy, essentially, who he didn't create the phrase, but he perfected the phrase in the world. <laughs> you know, he would get really close. He would get really close to the microphone and say, you know, in a world where, you know, a, uh, um, um, <laughs> uh, uh, a, uh, uh, um, comet was about to hit earth um <laughs> you know whatever it was in a world where a comet is about to hit the planet earth that was he was the he was the promo voice don lafontaine was the best of all of us and um i never met don um there were conversations over the phone. I had conversations over the phone with him, and yet never actually got to meet him. It's uh, it's been the uh, the professional the highlight of my professional career has been serving on the board, the board of directors of the Don LaFontaine Board of Directors, um, that tries to carry on Don's legacy. Uh, sadly, now more than ten years since he passed, since he passed away, um, he was the most generous voiceover artist who ever lived, and um, um, he. Uh, anyway, all of that is. Uh, there are nuances to that job that nobody who doesn't. Nobody who works in voiceover will understand what that means. Uh, how many times he said that line and had directors say, yeah, okay, um, Don, thank you for that. Could you try to sound smarter when you say that? <laughs> Don, can you say the in a world and sound more like every man? Don, uh, when you say that, could you sound sh shorter? Hey, Don, could you sound <laughs> taller? Don, when you say that, could you sound like a Hall of Famer? Um, it, you never know with directors and uh, or, or producers or, frankly, the sponsors, uh, the people that you're hired to represent. Um, so, yes, the the movie was quite accurate on a ground level level but now, now to uh, bring this to uh to wrap this up have you ever seen toast of london toast of london okay toast of london is a, a bbc i think it's a bbc I, I know it's a british show it's about voice actors uh and it stars this guy who is like the one of the most famous voice actors and he does a lot of these promos and one of the running gags is that he has two uh, producers in the studio who are really like dimwits and just based on what you were saying about can you say it like this can you say it like that uh he was supposed to say the word yes and you you can google this and i i i urge everyone to go look this up it is i, I i'm trying hard not to laugh just thinking about it and they're saying can you say yes just a little more like this and a little more like that so he goes and he <laughs> says the word yes 50 times in a row the same way and you know it's one of these stupid things that just by re repetition yeah. it's it's very funny so toast of london it stars matt berry uh it, it's available streaming somewhere i know uh, and uh yeah, oh, I, I need I, I need to go watch that. You need to go watch that. I I uh, years ago was working with uh, I, I don't want to mention his name. I was working with a professional. Uh, again, it was you know mumble mumble years ago. So this was around 1999 2000. Um, I was working with an actor who had been you know quite famous in the 1970s as a um, sitcom performer and uh, <laughs> he he just kept doing take after take after take after take um because he wasn't satisfied with how his performance sounded um and 
at the end of the day, I, I spoke with a buddy of mine who was working on the production end. And he said, yeah, I directed him years ago in an audiobook. And I said, what was that like? And he said, well, you know, he's a great actor. He really is when he's satisfied with <laughs> the performance. And I said, how often does that happen? He says, not very often. <laughs> he said, um, um, when he was working on an audiobook, he would say, um, well, um, I will move on to line two after I'm done with line one. And then once I'm satisfied with line two, I will move on to line three. And however long it takes to get through line three, then, you know, what have you. And, uh, and he said, the worst experience I had working with this actor was 56 takes oh, yeah. on a single line of dialogue. And I said, seriously, 56? And, and the guy knows, the guy knew this. He, he, at one point we were reading opposite one another and, and I did a line in, in one take and he raised his hand and, and jokingly he said to the author, uh, to the director, he said, can we, can we fire him because he's making me look bad? <laughs> um, but after 56 takes, and I, and I asked him, I'm like, are you sure 56? You're not exaggerating. He says, I edited the book as well. I'm telling you, 56 takes we had to get rid of. And I said, one line. He says, yes, one sentence, essentially, the guy wasn't happy with. And I said, well, what was it? He goes, well, it was one line of dialogue uh 56 takes um one line one sentence frankly it was one word i said <laughs> what he said yeah 56 takes of him reading in a dialogue sequence answering the phone saying hello <laughs> and i was like wait wait what 56 takes of, of you just answering the phone saying hello and i said and and after, when he told me this i was just cracking up because i had just worked with the guy <laughs> had been dealing with this for an entire day of him you know saying i want to take that again sorry i want to take that again sorry i want to take that again and he said uh he said yeah 56 takes of hello and i said um, can I ask, which one did you use? <laughs> and he said, oh, we used the first one. <laughs> and, you know, people get into their heads and they think, oh, this will be better than that. That'll be better than this. This will be better than whatever. And uh, your your instincts are pretty much accurate. <laughs> well scott brick it's been wonderful catching up with you after all this time uh i have not heard Moneyball yet i am going right out and getting it your version not the author's version and i look forward to hearing it i wish you well i wish you I'm, well uh safety health in this post-pandemic era that we're now moving into well, and I'm, I'm i'm so grateful that you asked me to be on today uh especially about this book um ron uh, Moneyball is a marvelous memory for me. Um, forgive me if I interrupted you. Um, um, uh, I have so many marvelous memories of memory uh, of of uh, Moneyball. Um, I remember there's a section in Moneyball where they talk about uh, um, so many athletes that I uh, uh, that I grew up. Uh, worshiping or despising because of my my uh, um, my love for the LA Dodgers, um, um, I just I remember when I was working on that book, thinking, "Wow, I get to talk about baseball for a week, a week. I get to talk about 
baseball out loud with friends of mine, the guy on the opposite side of the glass, uh, the director, producer of the book, James Ernaglia, and I get to get paid for it. It's, mm. uh, 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 it, it was crazy. There's there's a moment in mem in uh, Moneyball where they talk about uh, Joe Morgan, um, you know, the Hall of Famer, whom I have hated for decades because he killed my L.A. Dodgers chances of um, repeating as world champions in 1982. He was playing for the uh, he had moved from the uh the reds to the the uh um giants at the time and uh he hit a home run on i want to say the penultimate day of the 1982 uh baseball season that destroyed our chances of getting to the playoffs that season and um <laughs> there was a moment in, in that book where they talked about how inaccurate he was as a uh, as an announcer, um, as a play by play guy, as 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 a baseball expert. Uh, he was basically ignorant every time he talked about the um, the Oakland Athletics. And uh, I remember as I was reading it, going, "Yeah, this is my." This is my revenge for what he did to us <laughs> all of those years ago. Uh, God bless his soul. He's gone now. Um, Hall of Famer. But I, I just remember thinking, this is my little bit that I can do as a Dodgers fan to say, screw you, George. Uh, screw you, Joe Morgan. You were a horrible announcer. Um, um, and, uh, um, and I wish you would never hit that home run um it's uh it's absolutely marvelous getting to talk about these sports memories with you so especially after 12 years yeah uh, let's not wait we another 12 years uh, let's do that let's not let's not let another 12 years go by all right scott brick thank you very much for being with us today really appreciate it bless you ron thank you all right, take care